one person, one man in uniform has the power to rip this away from another person. You took my money. You kidnapped me, basically. That's how I look at it. You kidnapped me. You tortured me and many others. Look, look at what his actions did on a false arrest. Look what the, how that can impact somebody's life. For Complex News, I'm Natasha Martinez. This is how American soldiers look when they are deployed to war zones. This is how American police officers look when they are deployed to our own streets, when we exercise our First Amendment rights. This photo was taken in Santa Monica, California. By now, we all know the scenes of the Black Lives Matter protests that have erupted around the U.S. following the death of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and the many other innocent Black lives that have been lost at the hands of police. Whether we've participated in some of the protests or have been watching the constant coverage, most of the demonstrations across the country include two entities, peaceful protesters and militarized police forces. As each viral video flashes across our scenes, we see more and more just how dangerous the militarization of police has affected not only our society, but our ability to safely exercise our First Amendment right to protest. This has made defunding the police a rallying cry and one of the top demands by those on the front lines. The militarization of the police started with the creation of the 1033 program in 1991. This program allows the transfer of surplus military equipment to federal, state, and local law enforcement. Police militarization was fueled even more when the Department of Homeland Security gave police forces $34 billion in grants to purchase military-grade weapons and vehicles after the 9-11 attacks. Researchers say that the combination of the two set up a war-at-home mentality, in which local officers are now inclined to think like soldiers and use a military approach even for the most routine police activities. In terms of the protests going on today, this furthers the us versus them mentality in which law enforcement is trained to view the protesters as enemies at war. And we've seen that mentality play out every day since the George Floyd protests first erupted. In Laura Montilla's experience, she felt the LAPD presence at a peaceful protest she attended felt like a setup. When you were at the protest, how much of that military presence did you feel in terms of the weapons that they had, the, the arsenal, um, the gear? Can you kind of paint a picture of how much that the police had or how little did they have and how did that make you feel? Um, I mean, they were like multiple guns, like multiple guns, um, shield, helmet, just like everything, like decked out like they were going in for war and it's like hundreds of them had this like it wasn't just like oh like one line of officers it was like hundreds of them i would say it really shifted when like closer and closer to five just like as we're trying to get back like we go down a road and there's like a wall of like cops there so then we're like okay let's go down a different one and there's like a wall of cops there and then we're like going and going and there's like police cars that are like coming behind us so just walk me through when police finally closed in and started you know zip tying and arresting yeah um so we were at this point we're like all centered down and then they like asked us to make like a single file line and people were like very compliant and so like one by one, they like zip tied us, put us up against a wall. Um, and at first it like wasn't by gender, but then we're like up against the wall for probably about an hour um, before they like roll out buses. And that's when they like separate us by gender. While we're standing there, there was like, I had two like pat downs, which like since talking to other people, like not, I've learned like not everyone even was patted down because on the bus, some people still had their backpacks and their phones. But like when I was there, they like took my bag and like I got patted down twice before I went on the bus, even though there's cops watching me the entire time. But they like scoop if I don't know if I'm allowed to say, but they like scoop my vagina and like grab my boobs. And I'm wearing leggings and I have like a phone in my pocket and both people didn't even check my pockets and I was like, oh, by the way, like I have a phone and like so dehumanizing. And I think that's kind of, honestly, that part has kind of been the hardest part for me like since then, because 
I mean, prior to this, like when I was in high school, I like worked at a prison and like I've always had relationships, you know, with cops. And if I show I'm not a threat and I'm not doing anything wrong, like I'm going to be okay. And like this experience really showed like that's not true. And like that fear, I mean, it's what the black community feels every day, like times 10. You know, what was your point of view during that situation? And how did you feel like the LAPD furthered that panic, furthered, you know, not respecting the compliancy and making it a toxic and very frightening environment? I mean, I really, really tried when I was on there to like keep it together. Like at one point when, cause they, you know, they put us on this bus and they leave us in a parking lot for five hours. No one's on the bus. They still, we don't know where we are. They're not telling us anything. Um, they turn the lights off. That was really terrifying for me, just to like know that they knew and like no one was acting on it. Um, but also like I'm like claustrophobic, so I was also trying to like my zip ties were so tight. I mean, I still just have like like marks mm -hmm. on my wrist. Um, at first, we were like hello, and then we realized there was like no one on the bus, and so we're like screaming for help and then we like look out the window and there's just like no one it's just like buses and buses so we're like really like having to like yell like help help like medical attention and then an officer comes on and instead of like listening or it just like turns on the radio and turns it up all the way and it was rock music and so i like knew like that's a tactic that can like literally torture you and literally make you feel like you're losing your mind and like i immediately just like my anxiety just like rose and i was just like praying ambushing and the use of loud noise like in this case are well reported military strategies in combat and in cases of torture by the military in iraq since the start of the protests, police officers have been seen equipped in full riot gear with a heavy arsenal to match. Armored vehicles and military aircrafts have been omnipresent, and the use of less lethal weapons such as tear gas, rubber bullets, and stun grenades have been done egregiously. What many people may not be aware of, though, is that the use of these less lethal weapons by police against peaceful protesters may actually be a violation of international and human rights laws. Less lethal weapons are defined as offering a substantially reduced risk of death when compared to conventional firearms. Under that pretense, these weapons are thought to cause limited damage to those who are affected by them. However, tear gas is a chemical agent banned in war, and rubber bullets are known to disable, disfigure, and even kill those who are subject to them. Human rights organizations across the globe report that less lethal does not mean non-lethal, and these weapons have killed and wounded people, even causing some to live with permanent damage. Thankfully, that was not the case with Kevin Smiley. Kevin was protesting in San Diego with some friends, and towards the end of the protests, the police got violent, trying to disperse the crowd. You know, I, I don't see these police officers. I'm just, you know, kind of in the middle of the crowd with all these people, and um, you see people start running towards you, like a group of people. So once again, after that first time with the tear gas, I get right back in that mode again. Like, it's time to go, we gotta go. And then I start hearing shots fired. But I saw a woman on her back crying and she wasn't getting up. So I picked her up and basically like put her arm over, you know, my shoulder and my arm around her back and carried her. Another man came and said, pick one of her legs up. And I picked her leg up and we ran her to, uh, a street medic that was out on the scene helping people that were injured. And um, after that, after I had dropped her, I start feeling like, what's on the back of my head? And I reached back there and it was like, golf ball size, if not bigger, on the back of my head. And then I started getting like a headache. And I'm like, I think I was shot in the back of the head with something. And then I see more people once again running this way. And I think they were trying to, you know, get away from the police or something like that. And then I just hear, you know, stop. So I stop and I, cause I, I, I knew what it was. I knew it was a police officer. So I said, okay, I'm not doing anything. So let me just stop. I'm going to comply with the law here. And I did. And I started, I put my hands up and I started getting on my knees and somehow I, I still remember just being like 
shoved down and kept telling him, I'm, I'm not trying to fight you. I stopped. I, I'm, I'm listening to you, basically. And it was nothing but shut up, shut up, shut up. And that's all I could get from him. He told me that all of my possessions would basically be put into my backpack, which would then be put into um, the evidence room or the uh, property room, I guess. And he said, you won't be able to have access to that though, because we can't even have access to that right now. So at this point, it's kind of like, okay, well, why did you do that? Knowing that I would never be able to get those back. And what were your charges? Uh, they were just, there were two felonies. I don't, I don't know if I should exactly be speaking about them 100%. Okay. I am innocent, however, it's just things that are happening with my case and everything. Um, but two felonies and two misdemeanors. Mm -hmm. So and All for doing nothing, just walking home. Yeah, protesting, walking home, realizing that uh, things and trying to do the responsible things when you see that things are beginning to escalate. So you say, okay, it's time to go. And you do that and you comply with the law and this still happens to you. I want to go a little further. What, were the mm -hmm. police, um, were they dressed like normal cops? Did they, did you notice that they had maybe extra gear that might have seemed off for the the situation that you were in yeah he had a it said police here but as far as his gear goes i mean yeah i mean they were all geared up like there was going to be an insane war going on or something Continuing to use these weapons as part of the militarization of the police violates international law because their use must be restricted to situations of necessity and in proportion to the associated risk. Under international law, any use of force by police that exceeds necessity and proportionality is considered an attack on human dignity. However, in the U.S., international law does not govern the use of force. Instead, the system is operated by the principle of reasonableness and qualified immunity, which is why we hardly see justice for victims killed by cops. On July 28, 2020, Attorney General William Barr testified in front of the House Judiciary Committee about the federal government's response to the protest. And he also talked about you on that call, sir. Here's what he said. He said, the Attorney General is here, Bill Barr, and we will activate Bill Barr and activate him strongly. Do you remember that call, Mr. Barr? Yes, I do, but he wasn't talking about protesters. He was talking Mr. about Barr, rioters. Mr. Barr, apparently the president... As I, as I made clear, uh, moving uh, H Street out to I Street as the perimeter was a decision made uh, the, the day before. It was justified by the extreme rioting that was going on around the White House. Attorney General Barr justified using so-called less lethal weapons and force on civilians in Washington, D.C., Seattle, and Portland by categorizing the protests as riot and protesters as violent anarchists. Historically, police have used dated riot laws to justify suppressing righteous protests with disproportionate force, just like Barr is doing here. And those outdated justifications are proving to be a blatant threat to our civil rights as more protests get invaded by federal agents and local police, who are unnecessarily escalating tensions and snatching away civilians in unmarked cars and arresting them in plain clothes. In fact, a new report published by Amnesty International says that police in the U.S. have committed 125 human rights violations in response to the George Floyd and Black Lives Matter protests. Between May 25th through June 5th, Amnesty's report stated that law enforcement across 40 states and the District of Columbia violated protesters' rights to peacefully assemble by intimidation involving the use of militarized equipment, which in some cases can be categorized as torture in international law. Yet, we are not on international grounds. This is America and our freedom of assembly and democracy continues to be in danger. Because of that, Amnesty International has urged Congress to pass bills, including the Protecting Our Protesters Act of 2020. 
If passed, the bill will allow the prosecution of officers who willfully kill or injure protesters through the use of force and eliminate the transfer of military equipment to law enforcement agencies. It would be one small step in combating the very real issue that militarization of the police threatens the very fabric of our country and our civil rights. For Complex News, I'm Natasha Martinez.